NBC News correspondent Rahim Ellis is standing by outside the courthouse, also joining us. Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali, Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian, and former federal prosecutor Cynthia Oxney. Rahima Santos in custody now. What's next? Well, there's several things ahead for him, but we can tell you that that freshman congressman, George Santos, he did turn himself here into the federal courthouse here in Islip, New York. Uh, we believe he went in through an underground garage because we were not allowed in that area to see him, but court officials did let us know that he is now in custody. And as you point out, he is facing these charges. The indictment was returned yesterday by a federal grand jury here in Islip. It's a 13-count indictment, including charges of fraud, money laundering, theft of public funds, and false statements. Today's hearing is at 1 p.m. this afternoon, as he's expected to plead not guilty. Some local representatives here are hoping that he will just resign. Anna? And Ken, this is a lengthy indictment, so let's dig deeper into these 13 counts. Walk us through what exactly we know about these charges and the investigation. So as the U.S. attorney put it, Santos is accused of using political contributions to line his pockets. He's also accused of unlawfully applying for unemployment benefits that should have gone to New Yorkers who lost their jobs due to the pandemic. And he's accused of lying to the House of Representatives. So this indictment includes seven counts of wire fraud, three counts of money laundering, and one count of theft of public funds. And specifically, Santos is charged with defrauding campaign funders by using political contributions to fund his lavish lifestyle. As part of that, he's accused of telling certain contributors that they could give large sums of money that went beyond campaign donation limits. He's also charged with defrauding the COVID unemployment program in New York, receiving nearly $25,000 in benefits he wasn't entitled to. And he's charged with making false statements on the financial disclosure reports, listing his sources of income that he's required to file as a member of Congress. He's actually accused of listing $750,000 in income he did not receive. I've never seen that before. And I think that suggests we have not seen the last hmm. of charges because he's, he also loaned his campaign a lot of money. That is not mentioned in this indictment. Interesting. Cynthia, let's just again emphasize what charges he is facing. Seven counts of wire fraud, three counts of money laundering, one count of theft of public funds, and two counts of making false statements to the House of Representatives. Put that into perspective. Just how serious are these charges? Well, they're very serious. It's a really interesting indictment. It's like a kitchen sink indictment because a lot of these things aren't even related. I mean, the lying to the House of Representatives is totally unrelated to the campaign finance and the stealing of the COVID money. But I think Ken makes a very important point that everybody should focus on, and that is when they charge him with overstating the $750,000 in income, what we're talking about there is in the future, he's going to have to justify where he came up with a loan of $750,000 to his campaign. So I would expect a superseding indictment at some point in the future. But recognize the wire, going back for a second to the indictment itself, the wire fraud charges, uh, which are spelled out, you know, wire fraud basically means you were defrauding people and you 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 were sending money through the bank through the banks. You know, you made a, a wire transfer from here, twenty five thousand dollars from here to here. And that and it was fraudulent. Those those are not hard to prove. Uh, he's got a big problem here. This is somebody who needs to get serious about a plea agreement very quickly or he's going to spend a lot of time in jail. Ali, some Republicans were already calling for Santos to resign before we got these indictments. So what's the word there on Capitol Hill? Do you think the scope of these charges are now going to push any of the Republicans who are on the fence, like Kevin McCarthy, the House Speaker, to make a, a firm decision here? Look, so far, no, Anna. And in part, that might be because when the speaker came back from the White House meeting on the debt ceiling yesterday, he used that as an excuse for why he wasn't ready to talk about Santos's future here. But we did ask him directly in a gaggle of reporters if he thought Santos should resign. Nevertheless, this continues the idea that the New York delegation of Republicans, people like Mike Lawler, for example, are at odds with the speaker on this because watch the differences in their reaction from yesterday. Look at this. 
There's a clock ticking, and George Santos should have resigned in December. He should have resigned in January. He should have resigned yesterday, and maybe he'll resign today. He should resign. I've said that repeatedly, and uh, obviously these charges uh, confirm what I've said from the beginning. With George Santos, I did not put him on any committees. In America, we'll, we'll just follow the same pattern we always have, right? If a person is indicted, they're not on committees. They have the right to vote, but they have to go to trial. And so we'll see if Speaker McCarthy's answer changes today in light of the fact that Santos is actually in custody and we'll see him later in court this afternoon. But it is a real reminder that McCarthy's number game here in Congress has everything to do with what he's saying or rather not saying about the future of Congressman George Santos. We watched, for example, right. just two weeks ago how McCarthy was able to get that debt ceiling bill through his conference by one vote. It's a reminder that New York is the majority maker for McCarthy and he he needs every person with an R next to their name to be here in this building. So Santos still has leverage in that way, even though he's clearly in legal trouble right now. Right. McCarthy needed every vote just to become speaker, yeah. right? It went through 15 different rounds. Are you saying he needs Santos? Yes, and frankly, Santos has reminded McCarthy of this at a few various moments. For example, just over the last few weeks, there was a day where Santos seemed to say that maybe he wouldn't vote for the debt ceiling bill. Then, of course, he came back around and said he, he would. But it's a reminder yet again that Santos does hold power in this conference when, and we've been saying this from the day that we started those first of the 15 rounds of ballots for McCarthy to become speaker, in a conference like this one where the majority is so razor thin, it gives every Republican House member the ability to sort of be like a Senator Joe Manchin. They all get to be kingmakers and they all get to have their day where every vote matters. So Santos's vote, regardless of the legal troubles, still really matter here. And it might be an explanation why we see McCarthy still dragging his feet, saying that this is for the voters and the courts to decide and not he himself wading into the fray and saying what several in the New York delegation have been saying for a while, which is that Santos should resign. A reminder, Santos has already said he will run for re-election. Yep. And Ken, I just want to walk through what reporters have uncovered about Santos, some of these things he's admitted to, lying about where he went to school, lying about where he worked, lying about being Jewish, lying about his athletic accomplishments. Lying about raising money for a homeless veteran's dog, lying to donors, lying to investors, lying about his campaign finances. That list is not even all inclusive. Do you think there's more we don't know? I absolutely do, Anna. And as Cynthia was alluding to, it would not surprise anyone uh, who's familiar with how federal prosecutions work to see a superseding indictment in this case, because there are things that we know, for example, the FBI was asking about, such as that alleged scheme to defraud that homeless veteran over that money for his dog that, is, that are not in this indictment, nor is there any explanation for the source of the funds of that $750,000 he said he earned, some of which was loaned to his campaign. So those are unanswered questions that appear to be very questionable, and it would not surprise anybody to see future charges uh, along those lines.